Well, what a, what a kind introduction. Thank you so much uh, for that. And um, no pressure, right? You know, after, after something like that. But I really want to say um, what an honor it is to be here as part of this event, um, this terrific event connecting people who are passionate about hospitality, because that's what it's all about. Um, you can make a world a better place. And I, I read Will's book and just, you know, being unreasonable in your hospitality is what it's all about and making people feel seen, heard, and valued. And since today's theme is share, inspire, and connect, I will share some thoughts on leadership that I, I hope will inspire you and, uh, and um, you know, make, take some, have you, give you some takeaways um, to uh, take back to your organizations, your families, and everywhere that you're going. You know. Now, I know that this topic is one in which there are books, videos, podcasts, courses are thick on the ground. But I'm going to add my two cents by framing leadership in the context of do, know, and be of it. Because I'm sure if you've heard through other speakers and just know in your own experience that the culture, tone, and mood of an organization often reflects its leader. And that's why being a leader is such an important role and such a solemn responsibility. You know, no matter the size or type of collection of people that uh, is led, be it a corporation, a city, a team, a family, a restaurant, a hotel, or an army unit, the leader is the key to the success of the organization and the well-being of the people who belong to it. So first, what is leadership? We talk about leadership, and you know, in the Army, we have to define everything. We got manuals and pamphlets that defines every single word that you could ever come up with. So what is it? So after spending over 40 years as part of an institution that's steeped in learning about teaching and living leadership, the US Army, I'll use its definition. And so the Army des describes leadership as the activity of influencing people to provide purpose, direction, and motivation. And it captures what a leader should do, know, and be. Now, who are leaders? I mean, we've heard a little bit about, uh, in, the, in our last speaker, saying anyone that can influence others. And we're all leaders. So if leading is influencing others to achieve an end, then all of us lead are leaders, right? All of us provide purpose, direction and motivation as we go about our daily lives. You know, we can influence by our words and then silently by our, lead, our, our deeds, because we're leading when we're just showing ourselves out to others. And that's an, actually an act of leadership, believe it or not. And that's the what of leadership. And notice that this is neutral, right? Because you can lead others and influence others for good or for ill. And on the part of the influencer, it could be you know, ad, you know, inadvertent or actually um, deliberate. So now on to the implied part of the definition, what a leader should do, know, and be. So again, we said that leading is providing uh, direction, purpose, and motivation. That's what the, a leader must do. And of course, it requires an understanding of his or her, her, her organization, right? The mission or the task at hand. The basic requirement for the understanding of what an organization is actually for, not just what you do, but what you're for, and stay grounded in that. And this is particularly important during uncertain times when the buffeting current can cause deviation of the course as your team addresses this crisis or that. And I'm sure you remember a really important crisis not too long ago is the disruption that we saw from COVID. You know, when there are conditions that change and there's a need to either realign or totally revamp your organization to remain relevant to your customers and clients that you serve, you know, your purpose can become blurred and the focus of those that you lead can become scattered. So I can give you an example of my last job when I was the Surgeon General and the United States um, Army Medical Command Commanding General. I used to remind my team of over 120 different uh, military occupational specialties. That's what, that's what most people just call jobs. We have to have a name for it, right? A military occupational specialty. <laughs> but uh, that included physicians, nurses, dentists, veterinarians, logisticians, combat medics, environmental science officers, mosquito experts, believe it or not, helicopter pilots, and administrators, just to name a few. And I noticed some of the folks in the front row were getting a little bit nervous. They thought I was going to list all 120 of them. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't do that to you. I was just giving you 
listing a few to give you an example of what a diverse group of professionals that I had the privilege of leading. And so when you have all those, you have to remind them that, okay, you know what you do every day in your own individual areas, right? And those were some really different individuals that we had. But I also remind them, don't forget what we are for when we come together as an organization with all those experts in what they do. Uh, never forget what we're for. And for us, that was to ensure the medical readiness of our Army soldiers, meaning that they had all the preventive care needed to ensure that they were healthy in the environments that we at, were asking them to serve, to serve in. And we also, part of our four, was that we as the healthcare professionals were ready to deploy anywhere our Army asked us to to support our service members when they, were, when they were abroad. And so we had to maintain our readiness to ensure that we could operate in any environment that they were asked to as well. And our job, ultimately, as an Army Medical Command, all those 120 different occupational specialties, our job together was to get our soldiers that were ill or, or injured back home to their families safe and healthy. So remembering what we are for also helped us focus on all those subtasks and, and uh, things that we needed to accomplish uh, to, to do our mission. And it helped us weed out some of those things that inevitably kind of creep in um, that we address, but really don't add to our bottom line of what our mission is. And so keeping that what we're for in front of us, help us helped us um, keep that straight. It also made sure that we remain respectful of and appreciated the contribution of every single member of our team, no matter what their job was, or military occupational specialty. So, um, so when I was a commander of uh, Womack Army Medical Center, I, along with my sergeant major, would frequently pick a clinic to visit, you know, to talk to our team, assess morale and such. And one day we walked to the radiology department. We were greeted by the receptionist and we chatted a bit. And then I saw a young soldier walk by, um, very, very young, junior enlisted at the rank of specialist. For those not familiar with that, that's literally like one or two grades above, you know, private when you're getting, just, just getting used to your, your, uh, your, what you do in the military. And so then I asked him what his job was. And he said, well, I'm just a radiology tech, ma'am. Like, it really wasn't that important. And I, I asked him why he said it like that, and then he started to get a little bit nervous because he probably hadn't had a dialogue with a colonel before for that long, because I was a colonel back then. So he looked at the sergeant major who was with me as if to say, Ike, sergeant major, what am I supposed to say? And he said, you know, relax, soldier. She's trying to have a conversation with you. <laughs> you know, so, so, um, so then he replied, well, ma'am, you know, the combat medics are really the important ones. I mean, they're the ones that go out with their units when they're ill and injured. You know, and you've, you've seen them all in the war movies, right? When someone is injured, they call for the medic, and the medic low crawls up and takes care of them, bullets flying overhead. You know, those are the ones that, they, that are really the important ones. Everybody loves their medics. There's such a special bond with them. And that's true. But then I asked him to show me what he did in the clinic. So he took the sergeant major and me back to the x-ray room and showed us how he set up the room and, you know, put the, put the markers left and right. You know, those of you that have x-rays, you know you have to get the right side done. Um, showed how important it was that he had just the right amount of radiation so the patient wasn't overexposed. And then the angle, make sure he had the right angle to get all the parts that were needed so he wouldn't have to do a repeat film. And, and as he was talking about it, he got really fired up, right? And so, and then when I reminded him that if he didn't do his job well, then the radiologist couldn't do her job well. And there is a soldier that might be getting ready to deploy in harm's way that might not have an issue resolved if the, radi if the radiologist didn't have the, a good film to assess the uh, situation of the soldier. And then he paused for a moment and said, wow, I never thought of it like that. And then the sergeant major said, okay, soldier, I'll ask you again, what's your job? And he said, I'm a hot dang radiology tech, sergeant major. <laughs> you know? And so with a big old smile, I mean, it was so great to see because every, you know, the takeaway here is that every single person on the team needs to be able to trace back his or her role and how that fits into the mission of the overall organization. No, he wasn't a combat medic, but we absolutely needed our radiology techs as well. And in this scenario, it was my job as a leader to help him see it and every single member of my team as well. So that's what a leader must do, provide purpose, direction, and motivation. Now what a leader must know, 
And of course, a leader must be competent in his or her craft or, or area of subject matter expertise. That makes sense. She must know her organization, the mission, vision, all of the current environment uh, that they're in, the challenges, those that are allies, competitors, opportunities, priorities, resources, all of those things must be known. And then leaders must know who they support and who supports them. So again, in the Army, we have this, this uh, notion of supported and supporting units. And uh, usually there's a main effort, um, and then there's all the other units that are assisting to, that are either in, in support of or in reserve. But the interesting thing is that the unit that's being supported in one situation may actually be you know, the supporting unit in another, because depending on the, the nature of the mission and you know, what's required and what types of assets are required. And it's important for leaders to understand that the role they play depending on the circumstances. And I'm sure you might have been in situations in your organizations where you had to shift resources from one, one part to another and um, you know, based upon what the requirement was. And I'm, I'm sh sure if you've had to do that, there's consternation of, hey, what's happening here? Why am I losing the resources and it, as it's being put to someone else's um, you know, position? And it's really important as a leader to be able to help your people understand that um, because, again, for the overall mission, sometimes you have to shift things around to, to ensure success. So helping the team work through that delicate and sometimes not so delicate situation and balance is so important. And it's also important for a leader to have the situational awareness to determine which priorities take place and take precedence. Another example, you know, one of my clinic chiefs may not have been happy, in fact, I know he wasn't happy, when I had to pull half of his staff when he was the clinic chief, and when I was commander of the medical center again, there at Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty, North Carolina. But he understood that they were needed for a no-notice support mission for the earthquake that happened in January of 2010. Because, you know, as a medical treatment facility, you know, um, our priority was to ensure that our patients had access to high-quality care, that they had it provided in a compassionate manner, and had a great patient experience. I mean, that's part of what hospitality constitutes in the healthcare industry. So you can imagine how upset a patient might be to get a, a call the day of their appointment to let them know that they have to shift around and see a different doctor. You know, and of, of course, most understood, um, but still didn't uh, make, them, make them happy. Um, and though it ne negatively impacted his clinic operations, our chief realized that the priority was the relief mission. And he was able to make it happen and flex to that mission without a lot of drama. So we all understood that the units at, again, Fort Liberty now, had the rapid response mission, and this was a possibility. So leaders must ensure that their teams understand the universe of priorities that are in their areas, or actually war game what they might be asked to provide given the unique resources and configurations and capabilities that they have you know, for in, in a given emergency, and also have a predetermined list of what goat rises to the top when unforeseen events occur. And I know in the hospitality industry, there's always unforeseen events that occur. And so having your team understand kind of a preset amount of what's, uh, what's possible and then what they can flex to um, what they need to do that to make, the, uh, make, the, uh, su make success of the uh, organization. And finally, in the no category, and very importantly, as you all know, a leader must know his or her people. And I mean really know them, not just as names on a roster, but who they really are. And this gets really harder the larger the, the organization gets. And back to MedCom, we had over 130,000 people in the Army Medical Department, and I couldn't know all of them, but I got to know those that I could, and I ensured my leaders at the next echelon below knew that this was a priority for them as well. And so I, I just explained to them not knowing their people past what was on their resumes would not have allowed their teams to accomplish their mission and reach their full potential as an organization. So we talked about do, provide purpose, direction, and motivation. The know, content, situational awareness, and priorities in people. And now, finally, is what a leader must be. And this is the heart of it. I mean, a leader must have the character, values, and attributes to effectively and ethically influence others for the good. 
So what are those values? Now, in most organizations and professions, they have a code of principles and values that they, they conduct their business by and live by. And there are many out there, but for the purpose of this discussion, I'll refer back to those I live by in the Army. And those values, they told us that a leader must demonstrate loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And we as leaders were expected to really understand what those mean, to kind of inculcate them, not just have them in nice you know, social, media, media, social media banners or in posters, but really know what they mean and then reflect with them with our teammates. For example, loyalty. Loyalty is usually a good, good quality to have, but in what context? What if you're asked to do something that's not in line with our principles or something that kind of conflicts with the being loyal to a person versus the mission and the organization? And those were things that we talked to our, our soldiers about so they would understand and, and know when they were in that situation what they might do. They war-gamed it ahead of time so if they were faced with that, they would have something in their, in their kit bag, as we say, to, to, uh, to rely upon. And another important element of the B of leaders is possessing or cultivating an attribute that I believe is one of the most important as a leader, and that's empathy. Making the effort to understand those you lead is vital to the success of your organization because it helps you genuinely treat people with dignity and respect, and it gives your people a sense of belonging and feeling that they're truly valued members of the team. A famous Army general from the World War II era who fought in multiple wars once said, soldiering is an affair of the heart, right? You wouldn't expect to hear something like that from a battle-hardened leader, right? But he knew that you have to care about your people. And he actually even said, love your soldiers. You have to love them because look what we ask them to do and not just see them as items for use to get things done. And that ties to the previous point about knowing one's people. Again, I led an incredibly diverse organization, and I won't tell you about the 120 again, but all types of individuals, not only soldiers, but civilians, contractors, and Red Cross volunteers. And I made an effort to understand the unique situations that they were in and the unique skill sets that they brought to, our, to help us accomplish our mission. And it also helped me remember that each person to borrow a phrase from Pope John Paul II, each person is unique, precious, and unrepeatable. And they add value no matter who they are. And sometimes I had to remind myself that I may not just be able to see it given the lens that I was looking through. And so it's really important that we uh, take those lenses off every now and again and clean them, clean them off so we can see the other very clearly. Otherwise, there are so many opportunities and great ideas that we'll miss out on. And my final comment on the B of leaders is that Leaders must be people of character, so your people know that you can trust them. They must be transparent, so those that they lead understand what's happening and why. They must be constant communicators, so that they have uh, the most updated information to give out to their people, and then be in the receipt mode, so they can understand how the situation and, and what's, how this impacts their people, so they know what they can provide to support them and help them. They must be humble enough to know that they do not have all the answers and that they must rely on a diverse team with wide-ranging perspectives who are empowered to tell them the truth. And they must be optimistic, not in an unrealistic Pollyannish way, but remaining positive, perceiving challenges as opportunities to see and do things in new ways, and establishing the environment that will encourage their team to co-create innovative solutions for a way forward and to find the silver linings in those seemingly hopeless situation, not minimizing the pain and loss that everyone's been experiencing or has gone through, but acknowledging it and driving through it, optimistic that they can and that they will succeed. And leaders must remember that while in any situation their people remain their most valuable asset, they are the ones that will get the job done and leaders must take care of them. So I challenge each one of you leaders out there, and that's all of you, because you all have the ability to influence others around you by providing purpose, direction, and motivation. I challenge you to use these times to re reflect on how you can either fine tune or totally revamp what you must do, know, and be to accomplish your mission and improve the organization, the lives of your people, your customers, your communities, and ultimately our world. 
And I want to thank you so much for your kind attention today. Thank you.